Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Adriana Link, and I am the head of scholarly programming at the American Philosophical Society. The society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. Welcome to the fourth day of our virtual conference, Relationships, Reciprocity, and Responsibilities, Indigenous Studies and Archives and Beyond. We are glad that so many of you have joined us today. This week's conference is inspired by the important work of the APS's Center for Native American and Indigenous Research and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded Native American Scholars Initiative Program. A reminder that the conference will continue tomorrow with two final sessions at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Eastern Time, featuring the work of the Society's Native American Scholars Initiative alumni. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The Society promotes research by providing over a million dollars in research grants a year especially to younger scholars who need that support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check our website to learn more about what we do and for news of upcoming events. We are using Zoom webinar today, so do not worry, you have all been muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen. You can type your question at any time during today's event, and we will have time at the end of the session to get to your questions, probably about 15 to 20 minutes. We will also share any unanswered questions with our speakers who will work to make the responses available on our website. We're excited to offer closed captioning for this conference. If you would like to use it during the event, please click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. It is to the right of the Q&A button. The session will also feature simultaneous translation into Spanish. Please use the interpretation button on your screen to access the Spanish language channel available for today's program. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Jorge Rosas Nobrada, who will be moderating today's second panel on engaging digital archives to meet indigenous communities' priorities. Dr. Rosas Labrada is Assistant Professor of Indigenous Languages, Sustainability, and Linguistics in the University of Alberta's Department of Linguistics. Working within a community-based language research model, he has collaborated with multiple Indigenous communities in both South and North America in the documentation and description of their languages. The main focus of these projects has been the creation of annotated linguistic corpora that can facilitate research on these languages and be mobilized in the production of teaching materials for use in ongoing language revitalization and maintenance efforts. He has also worked with a number of legacy collections exploring ethical and practical issues in mobilizing and repatriation, repatriating linguistic materials. Welcome Jorge, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Adriana, and welcome everyone who's joined us this, uh, today for this panel on engaging digital archives to meet Indigenous communities' priorities. I'm speaking today from Toronto, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional stewards of this land, the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. I would also like to thank the APS for the fantastic job they've done organizing this conference, allowing us to be together uh, at a time when these conversations are crucial. I think it's important to acknowledge that the world is at a crossroads today, politically, socially, and environmentally, and that many of the challenges we're facing affect indigenous communities disproportionately or in significantly different ways. The indigenous community engaged research we've seen showcased here this week definitely has the potential to inform how we approach these challenges. 
So I'm extremely happy to be uh, here with you today and be part of this conversation. This afternoon, we have three papers. Our first paper today is Revitalization at a Distance, Engaging Digital Archives for Language Reclamation by Claire Bauer, George Hayden, Denise smith Ali, and Sue Hansen. Uh, Claire Bauer will be presenting on behalf of her collaborators. Claire Bauer is Professor of Linguistics with a concentration in language documentation and historical linguistics. Her 2004 PhD was from Harvard University and examine language change in a family of non pamanyungan Australian languages. Her current research focuses on the indigenous languages of Australia and elsewhere, and is concerned with language documentation and description, as well as prehistory. This includes fieldwork in Northern Australia with speakers of highly endangered languages, as well as archival work, shedding light in, on the linguistic history of Pamanyungan. She also works with Native American communities on language documentation and reclamation. Our second paper is on Maya, Maya Testimonies in the Visual History Archive, Violence, Linguistics, and Self-Determination by Brigitte French and Lolmal Garcia Mazar. Brigitte French is Assistant Vice President of Global Education and Professor of Anthropology at Grinnell College in Iowa. She's author of three books, including Maya Ethnolinguistic Identity, Violence, Cultural Rights, and Modernity in Highland Guatemala, uh, published by University of Arizona Press in 2010, Narratives of Conflict, Belonging, and State, published by Routledge in 2018, and Anthropological Lives, published by Rutgers in 2020. As a linguistic anthropologist, her work focuses on narrative, testimony, conflict, violence, and collective forms of belonging and exclusion. Lolmal Pedro Oscar Garcia Mazar is a Maya Cachiquel linguist from San Andres Semetabai, Solola, Guatemala. He holds a master's in the development of languages and identities of the native communities from Mondragon University in the Basque Country. Garcia Mazar has worked on Mayan language revitalization, documentation, and analysis for the past 30 years, and is the author of, or author of 13 books on Mayan linguistics. His most recent book, The Adaptation of Terms in Mayan Languages from Different Origins, 2017, takes up important and timely questions about language contact and linguistic borrowing in bilingual Maya communities. Additionally, Garcia Mazar has held several national leadership positions in Guatemala focused on Maya identity and self-determination. He was president of the Cachical Linguistic Community Branch of the Mayan Language Academies of Guatemala from 2008 to 2012 as well as served as Maya cultural promoter for the National Ministry of Culture and Sports of Guatemala in 2018. The final paper of this afternoon's session is Rowasu, a Shabanti Community Archive by Lori Yanke, Rosanna Dent, and James Walsh. And Lori Yanke is presenting. Lori Yanke is the librarian for anthropology at Emory University. Prior to joining Emory University, she was a Council on Library and Information Resources postdoctoral fellow at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, where she developed the Medical Heritage Library as a multi-institutional collaboration for the digitization of rare materials in the history of medicine. She was also a research lead for the Council on Library and Information Resources, study on data management practices among university researchers sponsored by the Sloan Foundation. Her work has been supported by several prestigious grants, and she has presented her work at numerous conferences, including the Coalition for Networked Information, the Digital Library Federation Forum, American Anthropological Association, the Society for American Archaeology, and the American Association for the History of Medicine. Rosanna Dent is an assistant professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. She researches at the intersection of history of science and medicine, Latin American history, and feminist science and technology studies. Broadly, she's interested in how human interactions unfold in the context of knowledge production and the implications of these relationships for questions of political and social justice. Her current book manuscript examines how Awe Chabanti and academic scientists have engaged one another in Brazil over the past 60 years. She grew up and lives in southwestern Pennsylvania, a settler on Napa land. James Welch is Associate Researcher of Human Ecology and Public Health at the National School of Public Health, Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, 
and research fellow at the Brazilian National Institute for Scientific and Technological Development in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. His primary research focuses on indigenous Awe Shavanti communities in central Brazil, addressing such topics as health and well being, social organization, environmental knowledge, and territorial rights. Welch has authored and organized multiple books, the most recent of which is Fire, Otherwise, Ethnobiology of Burning for a Ch Changing World, published by University of Utah Press in 2017. From 2011 to 2018, he served as a co-editor co of Ethnobiology Letters, a journal of the Society of Ethnobiology. After these introductions, I would like to pass the microphone to Claire for her paper. Hey, thank you, Jorge. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors for whom this is the middle of the night, um, but I'm here on uh, Quinnipiac land in New Haven, Connecticut these days uh, to talk about revitalization at a distance, uh, engaging, engaging digital archives for language reclamation. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this talk is about uh, the Chirilla project. Um, it's uh, a combination of contemporary work, archival work, uh, designed around a number of different, uh, what we might call academic uh, questions, outreach questions, and revitalization or language reclamation questions as, uh, as well. Um, it's been going for about 13 years now, and um, it's a combination of uh, ways of approaching questions around linguistic research, um, but also ways of approaching language reclamation that um, make the most of everyone's skills and the most of uh, the, the partnerships that develop when uh, people are on different sides of the world. So I, uh, I work in, uh, in Connecticut, um, but most of my research involves Australian languages on, uh, on the other side of the world. So I don't want to be proposing projects that would take time away from local researchers, um, but at the same time I have skills and resources that are useful to community projects. Um, and so this, uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today was the, the result of one of those things. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, we've been doing a number of different things with, uh, with language reclamation and um, language outreach involving word lists, books, and, uh, and things like this. But uh, what I'd like to talk to you uh, about in particular is the boot camp uh, project. Uh, this has involved four different languages in the southwest of Western Australia between 2014 and 2017. Um, the boot camp uh, idea is, uh, we've called it a boot camp because the uh, student, it's a collaboration between students and, uh, and professors and um, people in Southwest Western Australia. And we get together uh, both virtually and in person in, uh, in New Haven. Uh, the students and I work on writing a grammar of, the, uh, of a language based on the materials from archives. We meet every day and we do this in, in a single month. So we, we write a book in a month. Um, hence the boot camp uh, idea because it's very intensive. It's um, very focused on uh, on a single uh, single question. Uh, next slide, please. Here are some of the participants in the boot camp um, boot camp project. Uh, you can see from uh, 2015 some of the students and uh, and me and um, my little sidekick who was about nine months old at the uh, at the time. Uh, we've also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, collaborated uh, remotely with uh, members of the Goldfields Language Centre in southwest Western Australia and uh, the Noongar Language Centre as, uh, as well. Um, and so this was, this was a project that began from, uh, uh, from actually from Sue Hansen, who noted that there was uh, language archives in language centres and the local linguists who worked in the language centres didn't have time to work on, uh, on these materials. Most of the language centers uh, have constituents from uh, at least 
10 different language groups, sometimes up to 30 different languages. And if it's only one or two people, then it's very difficult to uh, give all of the language, uh, language workers and language materials the attention that, uh, that are needed, that's needed for projects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we, uh, what we did uh, as part of the boot camp. Uh, the basic idea is, uh, I guess, as I, as I mentioned earlier, where we get together as uh, students and a professor to work on the, uh, work on the materials. Uh, what does that, that mean? Well, we have uh, existing archival records of uh, a number of these languages. These could include draft dictionaries, uh, text collections. The dictionaries often have example sentences in them. Uh, we have uh, audio recordings in some cases. And so what we did was combine all of those materials together and looked for example sentences to, uh, to use for learners guides um, or for sketch grammars. So to compile materials so that the, uh, the generalizations about the language could be more accessible and so could then be built into um, both published books and lessons for classes, for local schools, and, uh, and things like that. Uh, we found that in order to, to do this, uh, we can't just sit down and write a book, right? It's saying we're gonna write a book in a month, that's, that's way, too, uh, way, way too hard to do. But what we could do was work on very specific individual questions about each uh, aspect of the language. So for instance, say we wanted to find out about pronouns in, uh, in the language. We would start uh, early in the morning and we would find all of the examples of pronouns in the sentence data that we, uh, that we had. Uh, by the end of the day, we would have pulled those together and uh, found all of the, the words that we needed, uh, examples of those words in sentences and had a preliminary linguistic analysis. Um, and then uh, we would workshop that, we would talk about it together, write it up, and then move on to the next topic. And so by proceeding piece by piece, micro chapter by micro chapter, we were able to pull together a, a book of about 130 pages uh, in a month. Uh, next, next slide, please. You might be thinking, uh, why why should we do this? What's the, the reason to write a grammar? What's the reason to do it in a month when there are so many different tasks for language documentation, language reclamation? After all, writing a book like a grammar is not going to lead directly to more speakers of a language. Um, and that's certainly true. Um, but what we were, were thinking here is, uh, well, actually, there are, there are a couple of different reasons why grammars were the reason that grammars were the, the thing that we wanted to, to work on and why they were the most useful uh, thing. Um, so for the, for the first part, for um, uh, community work, uh, the uh, community members that we talked to wanted to see books about the language. They wanted something over to uh, be able to use in school programs or in, um, uh, in community classes. And the existing materials were, were too locked up. They were too difficult to use for, for that. They were not accessible. Um, and so, so that implied that that's one thing that we could, uh, that we could help with. Uh, another reason is by working on a grammar, we learn a lot about the language that's not directly about grammar. And so by writing these grammars, we also were able to add a lot to the dictionaries and, uh, and then uh, expand the dictionaries, systematize the dictionaries, regularize the dictionaries, and, um, and thereby contribute in, in other ways as well. Um, a third reason is that working collaboratively and working remotely um, meant that um, uh, local speakers, Aboriginal community members in Australia um, received um, a great deal of support from uh, both the, the local linguists, uh, such as Sue Hansen, but uh, they also got the, um, uh, the intellectual capital and uh, the, the social capital through collaborating with, uh, with linguists from overseas. So it demonstrated to uh, local communities that the language was of value, um, that uh, it was something that um, had, uh, had interest outside the, uh, the community 
um, and that really bolstered the confidence of the uh, the speakers and elders and um, helped with uh, with their local uh, position as well. Now, of course, you can't eat prestige um, as um, uh, as we often say, but at the same time, the views of language within a community is a very important part of language reclamation. And so this was something that we were able to do um, uh, remotely to, uh, to, to help with that within, uh, within the community. Um, and finally, from the, the community perspective, uh, field work is often a very slow process. Um, if you think of uh, other types of books that are written, most grammars are not written in a month. They might be written in two to three years, more likely uh, could be five to ten, uh, 10 years. So to have a concrete uh, result within a month or so was a tremendous boost to, uh, uh, to, to the people that, um, uh, that we were working with. They could see that, uh, yes, this, these sorts of projects do produce results and they can produce results in a, uh, in a, uh, a reasonable period of time. Um, faster is, of course, not always better, but also slower is not always better as well. Um, and by being able to work collaboratively, being able to check our answers as we, uh, as we went, we were able to um, uh, avoid many of the problems that might have crept in by, by having to work very quickly. Um, let me briefly say just a couple of things about the benefits to the students as, uh, as well. So um, the students who worked on this project were all undergraduates from different parts of the US. We were funded by the National Science Foundation. And um, so they were applying to graduate school. And um, so having the opportunity to work as, uh, as a team um, and to work intensively on, uh, on data that they had never seen before really stood them in good stead for their graduate program. Um, more importantly, I think it also allowed them to see what real work with um, uh, uh, with language communities might uh, might look like. So they were able to see that there are ethical considerations we have to take into account from the start. Um, we can't just do what we want to do with uh, with language data. This language data. Um, is not just data. It's uh, you know it's people's um, uh, people's culture, people's ideas, um, uh, part of uh, people's heritage, uh, and so they were able to see that very directly and um, uh, see what it meant uh, and you know what a privilege it is for linguists to be able to uh, to collaborate in uh, in this way. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I'd like to to sum up very briefly now. Um, so just in conclusion, uh, these types of boot camps are not, uh, are not for, for everyone, definitely. It's not uh, the sort of thing we could do with a gigantic collection of, uh, of textual materials. Um, it's not something that would be appropriate if there's already a reference grammar of the language, for example. Um, but for the languages we were working with where uh, materials were locked up in archives and, uh, and limited, we were able to uh, produce a uh, a, a book that was useful for community members and would lead into the projects that they were uh, already working with. Uh, for students, it provided um, additional training, particularly ethical training, which um, uh, is, you know, is vital and did it in a way that uh, was integrative with the linguistic research that, uh, that they were doing. Um, so with that, I will pause. If we could go to the next slide, I just have some uh, acknowledgements. Uh, for uh, for this work, um, you know, I'm here presenting, but uh, but this work was uh, was very much a, a collaborative effort between um, language speakers in Southwest Australia, such as Denise Smithali, who is Noongar, uh, Geraldine Hogarth, and Luxi um, from the Kwada, uh, sorry Kwada, uh, community, Kedo Muir uh, from Ngalia. Um, also, the four years of boot campers, the students who've gone through this program. Uh, we were funded by the National Science Foundation, um, so, uh, so thanks to the NSF for that. And also the contributions uh, to this larger project as well. So more than a thousand Aboriginal people, um, 100 linguists and student researchers. Um, so with that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take questions uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the, the session when appropriate. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's my turn to begin speaking. So I'm Bridgetine French. I'm a linguistic anthropologist. And I want to thank Adriana and everyone at the American Philosophical Society for putting this conference together. I'm very honored to be part of the conversations, along with my good colleague, Lomai Garcia-Matzar, 
who's joining us uh, from Guatemala, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to him soon. Before I begin, um, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm in Iowa today. I'm in fact, I uh, grew up in Iowa, and I grew up on land that was taken from, belonged to and taken from the Lakota people. Um, and that's, I think, part of the reason um, I'm pleased to be here today. For our part, um, Lomai and I are going to discuss briefly a project that we're working on transcribing uh, and analyzing survivor testimonies from the Guatemalan genocide. And I will take just a minute to talk about the broader historical, political, cultural context in which we're working uh, that we think speaks to the relevancy and the timeliness of what we hope to do. And then maybe I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the data and then turn it over to Lodmai. Um, the things that I think are uh, most relevant to share in the little time that we have is to situate linguistics, sociolinguistics, anthropology in Guatemala in the context of a long history of violence and lethal violence against indigenous peoples there, um, Maya peoples there, particularly Guatemala in this century, in the last century rather, um, was involved in a 26 year civil war and armed conflict um, that formally ended in 1996, although uh, is still ongoing with lots of legacies in many ways. Um, from 1978 to 1984, those were, sorry, those were the worst years of the violence during which indigenous Maya communities were systematically targeted by the Guatemalan military, uh, resulting in around at least 200,000 people, Maya people murdered, and 626 villages absolutely burned to the ground, um, uh, over a million people internally displaced. So one has to think about and do research of any kind, particularly linguistics and anthropology in this very um, harsh and politicized context. In 1996, peace accords were signed in Guatemala between the um, guerrilla forces and the Guatemalan government. And as part of the peace process, both parties also signed something that's uh, known as the accord over indigenous rights and identity, which was the first time that the Guatemalan state in its existence had acknowledged the right for Maya peoples to exist and, and to maintain difference. And again, that's part of the context in which we're working. Um, subsequently, there were two truth commissions in which survivor testimony was collected, one done by the Catholic Church in 1998 and another then subsequently published by the United Nations in 1999 that found, in fact, acts of genocide were committed against Maya peoples in Guatemala. And that, um, I think, brings us to the context in which we're working that um, we're keen to think about and think with others about legacies of genocide, about the perspectives of indigenous survivors that have yet to be heard, recognized, discussed, um, and really elevated both, I, both locally in Guatemala, nationally in Guatemala, and then certainly internationally as we think about the interconnectedness of our global communities, which we have seen too well, right, in recent months. Um, I'll take maybe just a minute to mention the data that we're working with, and then I want to turn it over to Lil Mai. We're, so we're working on transcribing and analyzing survivor testimonies from Maya communities that were testimonies we didn't collect. They were collected by forensic anthropologists in Guatemala who um, had the job of, and continue to have the job of exhuming clandestine graves. Um, and out of, those, uh, out of those efforts for justice and peace was born this project of collecting survivor testimonies among those who wanted to offer their stories for justice, for human rights, and for future generations. Um, the forensic anthropologists have collected so far, their, their foundation has collected around 600 testimonies, 30, only 30 of which are 
currently available and only in video form. So our work has begun to transcribe um, those testimonies, transcribe them, make them available with the support of um, University of Southern California, hopefully others in Guatemala, and then to begin to analyze them um, and elevate voices and experiences that have yet really to be recognized. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lord Mai to tell us more. Eh, no sé si, si me escuchan. Eh, eh, sí. Sí. Eh, bu muy buenas tardes. Eh, eh, pues, eh, bueno, eh, Tina ya dio un poco el panorama como muy general. Eh, sin embargo, eh, para, para el análisis de los textos eh, necesitamos... Necesitamos entender bien eh, los idiomas de, de origen. Entonces, eh, eh, lamentablemente por el tiempo no podré presentar los datos. De las memorias analizadas. Pues dado que los idiomas mayas se desarrollaron de un tronco común, tienen muchas similitudes. Tienen muchas similitudes, pero también, pero también han generado muchas diferencias. Entonces algo común, por ejemplo, es que todos los idiomas mayas tienen 10 idiomas mayas, 10 vocales. Algunos desarrollaron un poco más y otros desarrollaron menos o cambiaron un poco la forma. Y en cuanto a marcadores de personas, por ejemplo, es que eh, los idiomas mayas son aglutinantes. Es decir, que toda la información se encuentra, por ejemplo, en un verbo, se encuentra la persona gramatical, el tiempo. Y entonces eso eh, nos muestra que al tomar ciertas decisiones o ciertas interpretaciones, esto... Esto nos puede ayudar para poder interpretar mejor las memorias que estamos analizando. Eh, algo, en la, algo que ha pasado, por ejemplo, en la sintaxis es que, es que los, um, hay por lo menos cuatro patrones. Eh, algunos, eh, bueno, todos tienen, excepto eh, un idioma, todos los otros tienen el verbo inicial. Y, eh, y luego cambia, o viene el objeto, o luego el sujeto, o al revés. Bueno, entonces, ¿por qué es importante esta forma? Es para que al momento de analizar los datos, uno, uno puede dar una interpretación un poco distinta a lo que, a lo que, se, está, eh, a lo que se está transcribiendo. Y por, eso es, y, y por eso es bien importante considerar todas estas similitudes y diferencias entre... entre los idiomas mayas para luego ver la influencia que ha tenido sobre el español. Bueno, 
Entonces, esta parte eh, necesita, eh, no lo vamos a presentar porque lleva bastante tiempo, pero lo vamos a considerar, lo vamos a considerar en el artículo final. Dado que nuestro tema es con lo del conflicto armado, quisiera iniciar con los cachiqueles en la conquista. En donde eh, Francis Polo Sifontes, eh, un investigador, eh, nos presenta que la doble conquista de los cachiqueles. En donde, en ese entonces, actualmente se dice que los cachiqueles han sido unos traidores porque, porque se, eh, eh, se unieron con los españoles. Sin embargo, eh, en ese entonces no, no había lealtad entre los grupos, o sea, no se consideraba... No, no, no se consideraba un grupo, eh, digamos, la población maya, cachiqueles, quichés, sutujiles, mames, no, eran, no era un grupo eh, como tal, homogénico, sino, sino cada grupo, eh, por ejemplo, en, justamente en ese tiempo, los, los quichés, los, los quichés, eh, eh, dirigidos por el rey Kikap, estaba conquistando, estaba conquistando muchísimo territorio. Entonces, eh, los carchiqueles, los carchiqueles eran aliados de los quichés, eh, eh, precisamente con, eh, eran aliados de ellos para conquistar otros, eh, eh, o, otros, eh, eh, otras comunidades. Sin embargo, a la llegada de los españoles, los, uh, la, la llegada de los españoles, los carchiqueles se aliaron con los españoles. Viendo, viendo las masacres que hacían los quichés en diferentes comunidades. Entonces, en esta parte, los carchiqueles fueron conquistados doble, doble, eh, eh, dos veces. Uno, uno a la llegada de los españoles, donde se aliaron. Luego eh, se, se levantaron contra los españoles, en donde estuvieron peleando durante mucho tiempo. Eh, como las guerrillas. Entonces, a partir de eso, eh, se, se habla de la doble conquista de los cachiqueles, en donde fueron... en donde fueron asesinados eh, los últimos gobernantes cachiqueles, que son... Cajimosh y Cajimosh eh, y eh, el Ejecat. Son los últimos dos gobernantes. Eh. Pues luego eh, Tina habla ya del conflicto armado que empieza en los años 60, en donde, en donde los, eh, las poblaciones indígenas también sirvieron como como le decimos aquí en Guatemala, como carne de cañón. Eso fue, un, digamos, fue cuando se empezó el conflicto armado, fue precisamente porque en el año 1960, un grupo... Un grupo, un grupo de oficiales eh, querían derrocar al, al presidente Miguel y Vígoras Fuentes. Y 
y eso fue gestado dentro del cuartel general en Justo Rufino Barrios. Entonces, eh, a partir de ahí, eh, no se logró el golpe de Estado. Y, y esto viene, tiene que ver con las diferencias, tiene que ver con las diferencias sociales. Digamos, la población común está acostumbrada de está acostumbrada a estar, eh, digamos, en una posición muy baja, trabajando por salarios eh, muy cortos, que no, no equivale a su trabajo, eh, no tienen tierras. Y en fin, todo eso fue lo que eh, hizo a que este movimiento surgiera. Sin embargo, en donde murieron, donde murieron más personas fueron básicamente la gente indígena. Por un lado, por un lado, por el, en el lado del ejército y por otro lado, en el lado de las, de las guerrillas. Precisamente por eso, por eso decimos que es, eh, los indígenas fueron carne de cañón, o sea, de los dos lados hubieron, hubieron, hubieron bajas. Bueno, para, para terminar, porque creo que ya es el, el tiempo, es, es, es mucho eh, para nosotros eh, como indígenas es muy importante el análisis de la, del conflicto armado porque creemos que debe enseñarse en las escuelas porque conociendo nuestro pasado, conociendo nuestra historia, podemos hacer cambios para que no se repitan esas, uh, esas atrocidades en la humanidad. Gracias. Thank you everyone for your thought-provoking papers and talks. I think the projects you describe are all excellent examples of the indigenous community-engaged research paradigm that I alluded to at the beginning of the session. A paradigm that is relatively new in my own discipline of linguistics, but has gained a lot of traction in the last few years. After reading your papers a few days ago and hearing your talks today, I've been interrogating how the mobilization of legacy materials, whether they be in the form of grammars as with Claire and her collaborators project, or in the form of new transcripts and translations as in Brigitting and Lomas project, or in the shape of new metadata and a new digital repository for their role as to project that Laurie and her colleagues describe uh, underscores the transient, ever-changing nature of archival materials. They are the starting point of these other new materials, grammars, transcripts, object descriptions, and they both inform and are enriched by the mobilization process. So if I could get started with the questions, I would like to hear your thoughts on both individual and community consent. It seems to me that these new uses given to the materials underscore the importance of consent as ever-changing, alive almost, in that it needs to be revisited and renegotiated. How have you approached the issue of gathering or regathering consent? Uh, I can take a stab at answering the, the question to, to lead off uh, quickly. So um, uh, this is one of the cases where working with a language center has been incredibly helpful and absolutely vital. Um, so I have longstanding relationships with individual Aboriginal communities. And so we, we talk to each other about these sorts of things. But of course, once something is published, it's, it's published, we can't get it back. Um, on the other hand, we've also seen that keeping um, language material under wraps, keeping it um, uh, not exactly secret, but unavailable is also potentially problematic for 
uh, for people who need to um, to have access to it. Um, and so it's been very much a constant collaborative uh, work here. Um, we have been we have focused um, uh, like the Rao um, uh, example on um, material which is not um, ceremonial or secret or sacred. Um, it's the sorts of everyday conversations that are appropriate for uh, materials in communities, like public type uh, type conversations. Um, but we also recognize that that, um, uh, that potentially loses important parts of, uh, of language and culture um, as, uh, as well. Thank you, Claire. Uh, James and Rosanna, would you like to comment on this, on the work you've done in the, the communities? Sure. Um, I'll just start by saying that this is, we're, because we're at a very preliminary stage with the project, we're still negotiating these things. Um, and so basically nothing is publicly available yet through the project as we build the prototype. Um, and that when, when we're, um, we were supposed to be in Pimentel this summer, but of course we were not able to travel. And um, when we do go back, um, this is one of the, I mean, the, the question of consent, of course, is both about community consent to work on the project and that we've already been working on. We've been working with a variety of different leaders, but also doing kind of public presentations about the project, which emerges out of a very long tradition of work that James has been doing, which he can comment on. Um, and then I would say that we're still trying to figure out exactly how the individual consent will work, but that there, we were cognizant of the fact that there needs to be an opt-out system um, for people to be able to take material out that that um, documents them and that that's going to be something that local administrators of the site are going to be best prepared to do. Um, so both being cautious about what we put in as we could develop a prototype until we can really develop a, you know a, a, a robust system. But maybe James you want to add something else? Sure, I'll just add that the Shavanchi are avid uh, meeting holders. They hold many meetings. Um, the, the men in the village, in each village, hold one meeting in the morning and one meeting every single evening to discuss community matters. Um, the women do not hold regular meetings, but the women will readily meet in order to discuss a certain subject, um, but not at the same time as men. So you have to hold a meeting with the men and a meeting with the women. But um, meetings are a very traditional form of decision, collective decision making in the community. Um, and so it's very easy to discuss community issues in that forum. Um, in terms of individual consent, one of the things that we've found is that uh, consent for non secret information, information that does not involve some sort of specific secret. Um, people generally, especially um, younger people, but also elder people, they recognize the heritage value of it. And they recognize that whatever their personal claim to it may be, there's a greater heritage value for the community at large. And so for the most part, people are very agreeable to share um, material and images and songs and um, interviews and whatever it happens to be. Thank you. Regine, will you and Lomar want to contribute something to this question? Sure, I'll start by um, saying that the data that we're working on was collected by um, the, the Forensic Anthropology Foundation of Guatemala following their, um, and they followed a methodology in terms of, of collection of testimonies that was set up by the USC Shoah Foundation to collect Holocaust survivor testimonies. So their method um, followed that path very self-consciously and then they went through IRB processes. 
then, so there is permission at that moment. Then there was permission to archive the material um, at USC Shoah Foundation. So we arrive at the data, right, with two levels of permission. Um, that doesn't, which doesn't, which doesn't completely, which doesn't answer the question of kind of what we need to think about more is ongoing permission and use of materials in ways that that speakers and community members may not have even imagined. I want to say one thing about that, and then I'll turn it over to Lord Mai, as former president of the Maya Kachika linguistic community. He he'll have things to say, but in the in the Guatemalan context, um, I would say the expediency, the urgency in some ways for folks to offer their stories is part of the motivating factor because it's not safe in the country necessarily to speak these things freely and have them circulate. Um, so there's a duplicity there about expediency and 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 risk that I think we haven't fully grappled with. And I'll turn it over to Lol Mai to think about from a community perspective, what does it mean to qué es lo que significa para dar permiso a usar los datos así y qué hay que ver con, con las decisiones que vienen para los hablantes y los sobrevivientes, ¿verdad? A ver, Lol si Puedes decir algo. I'm not sure if we, not sure if we lost the translation or if we have the translation, no? He may not hear us because he's on the standing channel. So it may just take a moment. Oh. Eh, sí, muy bien. Lo que, eh, bueno, hay dos, uh, dos situaciones. Eh, En, en el pasado y, digamos, en el tiempo del conflicto y ahora. En el tiempo del conflicto no se podía hablar nada, nada sobre este tipo de información. Incluso eh, si había algún registro en alguna casa y encontraban algún libro o algo sospechoso, Eh, era eh, básicamente muy peligroso. En la actualidad eh, hay un temor todavía en la población cuando, por ejemplo, eh, por cualquier situación el ejército llega a una comunidad, la, la gente eh, lleva esos recuerdos de una manera de una manera muy fuerte y recuerda esos momentos algunos de los uh, una de las entrevistas que tu, eh, que estuvimos uh, analizando es uh, de una señora que fue violada esta señora dice actualmente que cuando ve el ejército siente la misma situación de, 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 de impotencia, de miedo y no saber qué hacer. Entonces, a pesar de que ha pasado mucho tiempo, el sentimiento de miedo todavía se siente. Gracias. I'll, um, we have a little bit of extra time uh, to get to the questions from the audience. Uh, the first question I think is, uh, 
directed to Brigitte and Lord Mai and it's by Kathleen Shi who asks if uh, any Mayan languages are designated as official uh, by the current Guatemalan government. This is a question that Lord Mai should answer. So I'll wait for him to do that. Otra vez la pregunta, por favor. La pregunta es si el gobierno, uh, el actual gobierno de Guatemala uh, designó algunas lenguas mayas como oficiales. Bueno, eh, en eso tenemos mucha, mucha experiencia acá en el sentido de haber querido desde hace ¿qué? 20 años, 25 años, tratar de que haya un idioma a la par del español. Sin embargo, eh, hay posiciones muy distintas en cuanto a definir, eh, bueno, cuál, cuál idioma, por qué, por qué ese idioma. Y eh, una de las conclusiones de un seminario que hubo es que cada idioma sea eh, oficial en su territorio. Sin embargo, eh, tenemos todas las leyes eh, para poder hacerlo así, pero no se hace. No se hace. Entonces tenemos, tenemos eh, reglamentos. La Academia de Lenguas Mayas, por ejemplo, eh, tiene, eh, digamos, toda la potestad. Tiene una cantidad de leyes para poderlo hacer. Sin embargo, no, no existen las condiciones. No existen las condiciones. Entonces es complicado y todavía seguimos peleando para un idioma oficial en algún momento. Gracias. Uh, the second question from the audience, I think, is directed at uh, Lori, Rosana, and James. And, uh, Kevon Hushier asks, uh, if you, you think that version control of data and metadata would be a useful software feature in Mukuru and archive websites more generally. Um, I can see how this would be a useful feature. Um, we've primarily been uh, interested in descriptive metadata and thinking about how the, the objects themselves are described. I mean, we've also been really concerned about the permissions meta, metadata, of course, in this initial step. But, um, but I think uh, once we get most of that worked out, more interestingly, um, a platform like Mukudu allows you to have multiple layers of description of an object. And that's one of the reasons it's appealing to us. So that uh, I think we're hoping that at some point, the Shivanchi will, will want to describe sort of re-describe things that have been written or made about them in their own terms. And so I think that's a particular strength of this kind of work. And um, and I'm not a metadata expert, so um, I'm certain that this could be deployed in more sophisticated ways than I'm aware of at this point. But, um, but yes, I, I think that would be useful. Thank you. Um, I think the next question is something that we probably have all grappled with, and I think it's a great question. Um, Taylor Hummel asks, how do you define the communities that you work with? The communities themselves are not homogeneous, so how do you identify the people you work with and call the community in quotation marks? And I think everyone should probably be able to jump at this one. If you don't mind, I'd like to start because I think I feel like I use that word a lot. <laughs> um, so I think this is a great question because it gets right to the heart of so many of our um, challenges with developing this this archive. Um, and, and that's part of what we are getting at in terms of how do we figure out who decides what content is made public. Um, people 
change which communities they belong to and change the way they think of themselves. And so when you're building a structure like an archive, no matter how much you try to build flexibility into it, um, it's unlikely it will really be able to keep up with the way people think of themselves. So um, for practical purposes, we kind of are thinking of as the village um, and James and Rosanna can probably con comment on this a little better than I can, but the village seems to be a, a sort of a concrete workable unit that is very understandable for us and for um, the Shavanchi at this point. Um, the other elements that I mentioned during the talk are you know, much more complicated to um, implement technologically. Um, so I'll, I'll let others jump in with, with that. If you have other comments about community. I guess I'd just add that within the villages that we collaborate with, there are sort of established political structures and, yeah. and that's kind of what, why we work with a village as a sort of definition or working definition of community, but very much with the knowledge that um, not everybody, there's definitely not a uniform response to our work or, or um, engagement. There are, we have collaborators in each of the different villages that we're working with. Um, and so there's a negotiation about what those dynamics look like. And that's of course ongoing and sort of flexible. Um, and I mean, it, it, you know, there, there are also people who don't wanna be a part of it and are not interested. Um, and there's definitely space for that um, in the project as well. It's, um, you know, it's kind of, so, so just to say that that ambiguity is, is there, the communities don't have a unified voice necessarily, but there is a, a set of leadership who are officially charged with making decisions and who will make decisions on behalf of the community and then individuals can decide what they wanna do with sort of within that. And it, it's, um, that's how we've been working with it um, so far. Thank you. Claire? Um, yeah, in some ways, my answer is uh, is very similar. That um, uh, there are recognised authorities for who can make decisions about uh, language and materials. Um, that's not the same group as the um, wider stakeholders or constituents for who might um, make use of the materials we uh, we make. But um, uh, I uh, I defer to the um, uh, to the, the local authorities on uh, lo local authorities in the sense of uh, the um, the elders um, c community elders who make um, who make decisions uh, for the language centers and uh, and for their communities um, and th those people are, are well recognized and uh, and respected within uh, within those uh, those communities um, we do a mixture of um, uh, public uh, general access work and um, uh, more private work um, so for the uh, six grammars that we've uh, we've written um, two of them are freely available uh, the other four are v at various levels of um, restriction within the uh, within the community thank you um, this is the last question so we'll try to wrap up with this when uh, Bridgetine and Lord Mile, do you want to say something about this Sure, maybe I'll just say really briefly that when we're thinking about the community um, in Guatemala, we often talk about the linguistic community, right, or the ethno-linguistic community. And so it's not, it's certainly not so neatly bound as the, 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 the community, the village. Um, you know, when we talk about Quiche, for example, there are over a million speakers of Quiche. So we're talking about very large languages, very and very diverse experiences within them. So I would say the answer is we, at least for my part, we'll see what Loma says. We think about the ethno-linguistic community and then the, the range of diversity within that, right? So that it's never homogeneous. There's a tremendous amount of variation, variability, both linguistically, economically, historically. But Loma, has probably other things to say about that than I. Bueno, yo creo que, bueno, no, 
No, no mucho, pero tal vez solo ampliar que, eh, digamos, eh, hay cantidad, digamos, habla, eh, idiomas con una cantidad grande de hablantes, en donde cuando hablamos de comunidad lingüística, es, eh, entra todo, solo una población, no solo el, el área geográfica de un municipio, de una aldea, si no entra cultura en general y, y, y eso, ¿no? Eh, entonces, uh, yo creo que yo creo que es uh, básicamente lo que estamos usando para definir comunidad lingüística, ¿no? Gracias. Okay, I think our time is up. And uh, just take a moment to thank our panelists for their talks and their papers and the audience for their questions. And I'll then turn it over to Adriana. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Jorge. Thanks again to our panelists, um, to all of you watching and listening to our first uh, bilingual uh, virtual conference session. Um, thank you for your patience as we figure out the technology in, in this unprecedented event at the APS. Uh, a special thanks to our uh, translator, Carmen, for uh, her work uh, making it, uh, you know, making Lomé's uh, language and, and words known to all of you. Uh, thanks to our captioners for their intrepid work throughout the event. And I hope you will all join us tomorrow for our last sessions at uh, 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, when we'll get to uh, speak and hear from our um, fellows. So at 1 p.m. there'll be flash talks from our digital knowledge sharing fellows and then 3 p.m. a wrap-up conversation with some of our Native American Scholars Initiative um, interns, pre-docs, and postdocs. So I hope you'll join us then. Thank you all again for your work.